Good evening everyone once again my name is Rudy Page and welcome to another a chapter from my life and book this week we're with Dr Joan Myers OBE QN and of course as usual in collaboration with Eden Libraries. Good evening Nick once again how are you? <laughs> Good thank you. Good evening Rudy. How are you Joan? <laughs> I'm alright thank you. Good to see you Joan. Mm -hmm. Hope all is well. Yes, all is good. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. So, Joe, before we start, mm -hmm. could you just tell us a bit about yourself, your background, where you grew up, your family background? Okay, my family background is my parents are Jamaican, um, came over here in the 1960s. So, I was born over here, I was born in London, Wimbledon. Um, I've got four brothers and sisters over here and a few more over in Jamaica. Um, I've always wanted to be a nurse from the age of three. <laughs> My mother gave me a nurse's uniform as a Christmas present. And from that day, I decided I wanted to be a nurse. And I used to watch all the programs about hospitals and nurses, Casualty, Holby City, Angels was the one I used to watch in my day, yeah, doctors yeah. and nurses and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Great, yes, I, I remember that program. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you mentioned something about taking plasters to school. What, tell us yeah. about that. I, I used to have a little tin full of plasters and I used to stick them on my friends at school, friend, all my friends at school. And one day, I was about eight or nine, My one of my friends um, cut her finger at home and she lived around the corner from me, my best friend. She lived around the corner from me. And she would she refuse to let her mother put the plaster on her finger. So she had to come to my house. So I was able to put the plaster on for her. So I felt like I was a real nurse because it was okay. a little bit of blood there and I stuck the plaster on. Yeah. So I, so I always wanted to be a nurse. But when I was 11, my mum started her nurse training. She did her enrolled nurse training. And she advised me not to do nursing. Mm. She said, you won't like it. They won't like you. They're going to be in the harbour to you. They're, they're all racist. Mm. And I said, no, no, I don't want to be anything else but a nurse. Mm. And she made me promise that if I wanted to be a nurse, not to become an enrolled nurse, but become mm. a registered nurse. Yes. But in those days, they had the two level layers. The enrolled nurses were the practical nurses, the hands-on nurses that did the real, mm. real nursing stuff. And then the, the, the registered nurses were the ones that had the ability to go up the ladder because it was a free year. The enrolled nurse was two years and the registered nursing was three years. And obviously most people just did the two year one because that's what they were offered. But I had the 5-0 levels to do the registered nursing. So when I applied, that's what I applied for. At my interview, they actually asked me, why don't I do the enrolled nursing? Because it's only two years. Why do three years when you could do two? I remember I was only 18. And um, but I remember what my mom said because I always listen to what my mom says because I'm a very obedient child. And I said, no, my mom said I should become a registered nurse. So I was one of the very few black nurses at the time that went straight in and did registered nursing. Mm -hmm. Where quite a few of my friends started off as enrolled nurses because that's what they were offered. Yeah. But I was offered the I did the registered nursing, so I was able to go up the ladder quite um, quickly as a black person. So I was one of very few black nurses at that time mm -hmm. that was able to go up into leadership and management. Yeah. yeah and you've not looked back since no i remember the the day I, I was on the on the late shift as a student my results came out the next morning before my next late shift and i remember going into work to say i've got my results i'm a qualified nurse now and the sister on the ward said okay you're in charge here's the keys and they just put me in charge and that was it because that's how they did it in those days. They wouldn't dream of doing that now. No, no. What, what, what a great leadership test as well. <laughs> Getting yeah. in, as we used to say, you better yeah. swim. Yes. Well, they did train us to be in charge. They used to just throw us in the deep end. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Excellent. Nick, over to you. So was there an actual occasion in your life or something that inspired you to decide, this is what I want to be? I want to be a nurse above anything else it was the the uniform and the, the, all the stuff that goes with being and watching all those programs and tv and being able to care for people and just see that you could see the improvement in them so even when i i wanted to look after children because i love children so i did my general and then i went into pediatrics children's nursing but i absolutely loved it but i used to cry when the children were crying when they were having their injections done <laughs> i used to hate giving injections and when the doctors were putting needles in when they're putting cannulas in 
and I'd have to hold a child's arm, uh, my tears would be dropping on the child's arm where the doctor's trying to put the needle in. I remember one of the doctors saying, get this nurse out of the room now. So I didn't know whether I'd be able to cope with that, but I, I soon learned what to do because as I, I realised I could get everybody else to do what I didn't want to do, because obviously if I'm in charge, <laughs> and the students, so I'd get the students to do the injections and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. What a nice bit I did. Yeah. So, so what are you most proud of in your overall career in nursing? Uh, I, what I'm really, really proud of is the fact my specialist area of interest is um, eczema, the management of eczema, no dry skin condition in children. And I always remember this little boy, he was about 23 months old, called Leon, that had really bad eczema all over his body and we had to put band special bandages on and lots of creams. But it was amazing how once the creams were on, his skin was smoothing out and it would get better. So that's that was the area that I loved because you just put it on the top, you could see it getting better. And what I'm really proud of is that I was able to set up an eczema, a nurse-led eczema clinic in Islington. And it was a bit of a challenge because the dermatologist didn't want me to because for a start, what is a nurse consultant compared to a dermatologist? And plus I wasn't a dermatologist and I wasn't interested in what do you have a dermatology things, only in eczema. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully I had the support of the other doctors that helped me to set up the clinic mm -hmm. and I had a nurse consultant who was a dermatology nurse consultant whereas I was a paediatric nurse consultant she supported me and I was able to have my own prescription pad I did the nurse prescribing so I could assess them diagnose and treat them and what I'm really proud of is the fact that the majority of children in the area were black or brown mm -hmm. and their eczema was different yes to how it manifests in white people I mean, because white skin, you can see it's all red and inflamed, but in black people, you don't see it so um, vividly like that. And I remember being on the NICE guidance, you know, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Mm -hmm. Excellence. They had a, um, a, a panel discussion talking about children with eczema. I was the only black person in the room and I was the only community person. There were other specialist nurses there and dermatologists, but nobody talked about the skin. And I just said, did you know that black skin is different to white skin? Mm -hmm. And it all went silent and they all looked at me and they said, yes, we do know. And I said, because the skin is different, it presents differently. And as a result, often children are misdiagnosed. People diagnose as children of having scabies or, or something, ringworms. How could a baby have ringworms? Ringworms or scabies when it's eczema because it presents differently. And, and because of the melanin in the skin and the inflammation, it looks different. And because I said that, they actually wrote it in the, if you look at the NICE guidance for children with eczema under the age of 12, it actually says children from African, Caribbean and Asian descent are more likely to present differently. And I also mentioned about the creams. We give them these white watery cream to put on their rough skin. And I said, black skin, our skin, darkly pigmented skin, prefer, prefers emollients like oily creams because yeah, we used to share butter, yes, cocoa yeah. butter yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So. They took take that into consideration. So when I do training with the doctors, even the GPs, they know now to give the more oily creams to the black children or black and brown children rather than the um, white cream that's sort of water-based that doesn't do very much. Yeah. So that, that was really fantastic for me. But really key was I wrote an article about the difference in black skin in 2005, and they told me I didn't have enough evidence for it other than my own mm -hmm. clinical judgment. I needed to have empirical evidence and so I wrote it and then they said they needed more information than what I had and so that was in 2005 but in 2015 That's when I was a senior lecturer at London South Bank University I did a big Cochrane library review and I checked out all the different stuff and then I wrote the article so my best ever article was the challenges of managing eczema in darkly pigmented skin and in that I found out the reason why as black people we always look young even though we might be quite old our skin is plump because we've got collagen built into our skin. And so we, our skin is plump and we're more not likely to get wrinkled. Whereas white people, the, the collagen comes out of their skin. And so it's not in their skin like in us. So that's why they get more drawn and more prone to be wrinkled compared to us. So I think very, you that in my article. Very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> but I, I think as well, and I can understand you being proud of it because if you think of the, you know, the, the first unchanging goal of the NHS, you know, to provide high quality service mm. or co quality care for everyone in the in the population. So that's that's really good. 
Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you overcame some of the system challenges as well and, and the barriers that are w within the system. Mm -hmm. and having said all that then, so, so how would you encourage others to be resilient and overcome some of the, the, the challenges that, are, that continue across the NHS? I think we have to have self-belief. We have to believe that we're good enough because the system would try and give you the impression that you're not good enough, that you you have to keep jumping through hoops, bending over backwards and forwards, working over and above your job description. People say they, they have to do that and they're told that they need to do that. But I just do what my job tells me to do and I don't do anything more. And I remember somebody giving me an example. If you said, um, say your manager asks you to go and get him a cheese sandwich, but then you go out and get him curry goat and rice and peas. <laughs> he's going to take the curry goat and rice and peas and he's going to enjoy it. Next day, you ask for a cheese sandwich and you get him curry goat and rice and peas again. And you do that on a regular basis. And the day that you actually do get him a cheese sandwich, he's going to ask you what's wrong. What's the problem? Why are you not giving me what you normally give me? Because we go over and above. So we set ourselves up for failure sometimes. So I just do what I need to do. And, and I stand up for myself as well. I, I, I'm not one of those. I'm not shy in coming forward, as you know. If somebody says something that upsets me that I don't understand, why did you say that? What, why, what was the reason for saying it like that? That was, I found that really disrespectful, undermining. Why did you do that? I'll take them aside and tell them. And I had, I've had some fantastic coaches, mm -hmm. Lynette Phillips, OBE, Nola Ishmael, OBE, Dr. Neslin Watson, Drury, CBE, Dame Donna, there's loads of them. I mean, there's simply loads. And I could, I had them on tap. I could just phone them up to say, guess what my manager said to me today? Or guess what happened? And then they would talk it through with me and help me to understand and, and give me the right words. Because I think that's what it is. Sometimes we're blindsided by the things that said to us and things that people do. Like one time I was working, the first time I was working in the Department of Health and I couldn't believe it. They were talking to everybody, asking them for information. And they went around the room and they asked the first person, they gave the information and they put it on the flip chart. The next person, well done. And they put it on the flip chart and they got to me and I said my bit. And it was as if I never spoke. And they just went over me to the next person and the next person. And then they repeated what I said as if it was their idea and wrote it on the flip chart. And I remember standing there looking around the room at everybody thinking, did that actually really just happen? Is that me? Did I really say, maybe I didn't say anything. Cause then it's, it's, kind, it's kind of think, is it me? Is it them? And then I remember explaining it to um, Lynette and she just said, it's called the psychology of avoidance. They just avoid you and they just pretend that you're not there. But you have to know how to deal with it and she just tell me what to do to deal with it yeah yeah so it's really important you can't you can't do it on your own you do need support you need mentors and coaches and some people think the higher up the ladder you go the easier it gets it doesn't it, they're very very subtle and in the things that they do but you need to be really clear about where you stand and i like to stop it before it starts so as soon as they start behaving badly i tell them straight away so they know <laughs> don't mess with joan <laughs> Very true indeed. So, 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 what is the best advice then you can give a, a young person now today who wants to go into nursing? You know, um, if, they, if they want to go into nursing, it's a phenomenal um, career to have because it has so many branches and levels to it. And you can work in the hospital, in the community. You could be at a strategic level. You could do all the different specialisms: adults, children. You could travel around the world. World is. There's so much to it and all the, the skills are transferable to other occupations as well. But you do need to have, believe in yourself and you do need to have support as well around you. And actually at the moment, I'm doing um, training and development in different NHS organisations, um, black and ethnic minority talent programmes, just helping and supporting them to have self-belief and how to manage themselves as well. Because sometimes we just don't know how to manage ourselves yes. i found it difficult for quite a while <laughs> yeah that, that self-discipline is mm, so yes. essential within the system so tell, tell us a bit about your contribution to the book nursing nursing a nation well i was really i mean i was blown away when i got a phone call telling me there's a book being written and they got a chapter on me and they were asking for my picture i said what book what tell me about and they're talking about the wind rush and they're going to have a statue in the grounds of um, Whittington Hospital and the chapter's written and they've been trying to get hold of me. And it just happened that one of the organisers knew who I was and she got in contact with me. And I said, well, you can't just write a chapter about me and 
put a picture in it without my permission. Send the chapter and the picture. And when they sent the picture, I said, I don't like that picture. I don't even look like that anymore. And so I said, and I gave them the picture that I wanted. And then I read the chapter. I said, that didn't happen like that. You know, they, they, write, they put it all together from wherever they got it from. Yeah. So I was able to reword it mm. and, um, and put it back together the way it's supposed to be. And um, Nubian Jack, when I met him, he actually said that my chapter was the last chapter in the book. It completed the book just in time before they sent it in for publishing. So when I got my copy, I went to the book launch. I was so impressed mm -hmm. with the book because it's got so many people in it that I do know. I mean, people that I, and you can look in the book and read people that I do know, but also the history of nursing and medicine and the fact that um, African and Caribbean nurses have been in this country from way back when. I mean, did you know that Hel Selassie's daughter was a paediatric nurse at Great Woman Street Hospital. Really? And that she also worked at Guy's Hospital in 1936. Okay. So, I mean, before all that stuff, I mean, could you imagine that? Yeah. We didn't know that. Nobody told us stuff like that. So just all that information is in there. And also about our, the way we treat um, um, different conditions in the West Indies and in Africa and how it, it is quite successful in the way we manage stuff compared in, to this country in some cases. So yeah. that was like a valuable resource in itself. Yeah. Yeah. I've got it right here. I would recommend everybody gets a copy. It's very thick. Okay. And you'd be amazed. It's got the great and the good in there. The yes. re all the people that you will mostly know. Yes. You know the majority of them. Um, Blossom Jackson was, mm -hmm. was on the platform a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I know that she was, she was in there as well. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, so Nick, last last question really. So, who who are your role models or your coaches, mentors in nursing, and why are they so inspirational, and how did they help you? I did mention a few already, but Lynette Phillips, OBE, was the first person that approached me. I didn't know her. I used to see her at different conferences, and she used to say, "What are you doing next? Where, where are you going? Are you?" And I goes, well, I'm not doing anything next. I'm a nurse consultant. What else do I need to do? You don't ask medical consultants what they're going to do next. She said, no, you need to think of where you're going next. And I remember I applied for a role at the Department of Health and I didn't get it. And the next time when I applied for it again, she saw me when I, I said, oh, by the way, I'm applying for this job. And she said, I'm going to coach you. You're going to have five two hour sessions over the next two weeks to prepare you for your interview. And that was the best interview prep I ever had and I would recommend that to anybody no matter how high up you are you do need to be prepared for interviews sometimes we think because we've got the skills and the competences and the abilities that we could just do it but there's more to it than that and she was able to prepare me for that role so that when I went for that role at the Department of Health they said nobody else stood a chance that I blew everybody out of the water <laughs> so she was she really she was fantastic so she's really great for interview preps and stuff Dr Nola Ishmael with her wisdom she is superb Absolutely. So she just comes from another angle. And because she's she's one of the first um, black directors of nursing in, in the um, Department of Health as well. So she has a lot of insight in that area. And then for me as well, Neslin, Dr. Neslin Watson Drury, CBE. When I got my last role, I was the um, Associate Director for Health Service and Chief Nurse. And I said, after I got my job, because I always say, when you're new in the role, you can ask for lots of things because they really want you. So they would do whatever. So I was asking for a PA. I was asking, I said, I need executive coaching because I've been a nurse consultant for 14 years and to be a chief nurse is a big leap. So I need executive coaching. And my, my manager said, of course, Joan, it's over and above your pay grade. We will pay for your coaching once a month for six months and review it again. And I said, well, I just want Dr. Nesley Watson Jury CPE. And he goes, I want her too. I goes, no, I've got her now. So they paid for me to have Nestle and, and I had her for at least almost two years and the whole time that I was there. And it's really good to have somebody to go to, to ask for advice, the direction, guidance along the way. So yeah. I commend them. And that's just a few that I can mention. I can mention a whole lot more. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so important. And as you're saying, regardless of how high you move up, mm. you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And the, yeah. the mentors are there to guide you and to, to really give you an insight into that environment that, that you're now entering, which is mm -hmm. very new. And in fact, I first came across you when you did the report, the Mary Seacole report. Yes. 
department. Yes. So that's when I was at the, I got the role at the Department of Health to actually review the Mary Seacole okay. report. And, and I said to them, I'm only here two days a week. I can't, I haven't got two days to do all this other stuff that I was doing. And that, so I asked for Lynette to be commissioned to do it. And it had to go through all the right channels, but thankfully they chose her to do it. And she did it, but because it's the Department of Health, it has to have, it has to be done in a particular way. So I had to have my name on it. And I said, no, I want Lynette's name on it. They said, we don't do it like that. Because, but she was the one that did most of the work. So I went on and on. And in the end, they put at the back special um, acknowledgements to Lynette Phillips, OBE. And then I also wanted my picture in it. And I said, well, because I did it, it should have my picture in it. it said, no, no, it has the chief nursing officer in it. I goes, well, she could be in it too. And then I could be in it as well. But we'd never do stuff. I said, but remember when I leave here, nobody would remember that I've been here. But if there's a picture of me, they will remember. And they goes, okay, Dan. And so they allowed me to have my picture yeah, in it. Yeah, and, well. and these, these uh, points are really important. That's mm. why we must write our own case studies. Yes. To make change within the system so that our name is on it. Yeah, it's and just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean that it can't be done. It, it does, it, it's just a convention. If it hasn't been done, it's just a convention, which means it can be done if you mm. have the will. And I think also what you've said there, which is really important, particularly in the environment that we are in now, which is most commendable, the fact that you were willing for your colleague's name and determined that, that they should be mentioned, so it's mm. not just about self, there's mm. that... that level important level of servant leadership which is essential for you know for the community to thrive within mm. the within the nhs system as it is today and yeah the, and i know I think we have to support each other along the way and, and take really them along with us absolutely. So when i got in the department of health i said i'm not just going to open the door i'm going to take the hinge off the door <laughs> and let everybody in <laughs> so whatever i could do to support anybody along the way that's what i do absolutely. yeah Absolutely. Thanks for that. So, so Nick, as always, I'm going to leave the last question with you. And you've seen how inspiring Joan is, and she's, she's done a lot around the system. And um, and in fact, before I come to you, Nick, Joan, you 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 you're involved with a charity. Tell us a bit more about your charity. Oh, uh, in Kenya, I went to Kenya. Like next year will be twenty years ago. Went to Kenya. I'm a, I'm a Christian, by the way. I was evangelizing, and I just felt like God was saying, "Everybody knows God loves them. Jesus loves them. You love them. Just demonstrate my love in action." And He just pointed out one little girl in this big market square with hundreds of children, and He said, "Bless that little girl, and by blessing her, all the children in the village will be blessed." Mm. And I thought, okay. Didn't really know, understood what it mean really. But then when I spoke to the little girl's mother, I just said that I will pay for her education and school uniform for the next 10 years. And while I was saying that, I was saying, really, Joan, how are you going to do that? You've got no money. Stop talking now. And I said, for the next 10 years, and I said, whatever school the pastor's what daughter goes to, I want her to go to that school. So it was the most expensive school in the area. And actually more people became Christians on that day than the whole week that I was there just through demonstrating the love of God in action. That was 20 years ago. That little girl is going to be 23 on the 2nd of December. When she was 18, she told me that I was her greatest role model and she wants to be like me. So she's doing her nurse training. So she would qualify next year. She should have qualified this year, but because of COVID, it's been pushed back to August next year. So she's going to qualify as a nurse and a midwife. She's absolutely phenomenal. And through that, I've got over 25 children and her older brother, he wanted to be a lawyer. He grew up in the slums, the teachers laughed at him, everybody laughed at him, but he was really good at his stuff. And when he told me he wanted to be a lawyer, my friend who was sponsoring him in America, she's actually a lawyer. And she, when I told her that she sponsored this guy that wants to be, she got all excited and she paid for him to do his diploma in law. Right. He passed with credits. And so we just continued sponsoring him and he's nearly finishing his um, law degree now. And he was the one that helped me to purchase the land in Kenya so I could do I want to build a children's home, a church, a school, and a health centre on that land that we've got. So I'm going over it in December, and in April we'll be a, we just have a medical mission on the land and do all the stuff on the land. So, yeah. Excellent, and we're actually planning some stuff with the Kenyan diaspora, so I should definitely Fantastic. touch with you with that. And, mm -hmm. it, and it is about health and faith yes. and everything, so great. Mm. Thanks for that. Nick, final word. I'd just like to say you're an amazing, amazing individual who's done amazing things. Um, my question is, 
what keeps you going? What keeps you driven to just keep knocking down every next door and never stop pushing? I suppose it's my faith in God, first and foremost, and maybe the way my mother brought me up. She brought us up to know that we're all here for a purpose. We're only here for a very short time. So while we're here, we need to do whatever we can to bring about change, to bring about improvement. And I don't like people being treated badly. And if I know that I can help and to support somebody along the way, it doesn't matter who they are, whether they're black or white, young or old, male or female, that don't have to be a nurse, anybody, then I would do that. So when I retired from the NHS, I actually set up my own consultancy. So I do mentoring and coaching and interview preps and stuff like that. And for me, it's, I just feel so wowed when people get through and they get their jobs, especially those that have been waiting for a long time. I have this saying, everybody remembers my saying, go where you're celebrated, don't stay where you're tolerated. Anytime you're denigrated, you will never be appreciated. So there's many people, when they hear that, they decide they're not putting up with the foolishness anymore and they leave that job. I mean, how could you be in a job for 10 years, applying for promotion and not getting it? I said, don't you get the message? They don't want you there. That's why you're still in the same position. And they're allowing people that they trained to now be their manager. And then they have to train their manager to do the job that they've been told that they can't do. So if you can't do the job, how could you train somebody to do it? I said, think about it logically. Just get up and go. There's lots of other places to go to. And many of them that go, they, they progress and do better. And they realize that they're even better than they even thought they were because they were being undermined and put down for so long. So for me, that, that's what makes my day when I hear, um, how, how I could support somebody and see the results of it, of getting their jobs and progressing and stuff like that. Yeah. Excellent. Mm. Thank you very much, Dr. Joan Myers, OBEQN. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, look forward to seeing you again soon, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas, as well. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs>